Good morning. Am I, if it's my uh, opportunity now to speak, um, I am uh, very happy to be here. It's early morning in Estonia. Uh, it's darkness around me, but I'm uh, uh, used to being very early because I am a CEO of uh, uh, a CRO, which is Pan-European and Ukrainian. And I also am co-founder and co-CEO with uh, Dr. Charles Kim of Gaia APAC, uh, based from South Korea. Now, as a CRO, we specialize in uh, smaller companies. Uh, maybe they're uncertain in how they wish to develop their drug. Uh, we're agile and we're flexible. And we work as part of the team with the sponsor uh, to sponsor our client. My uh, talk this morning is about ICHE3, the clinical study report. And um, I want to say at the beginning, this is what I'm going to cover, the general content, the regulations, the general content, the FDA, ICH clarifications, uh, the type of clinical study report, that is the option, and the key items in preparing, writing, and reviewing a CSR. I want to say that um, the reality of a CSR, a clinical study report, is this, of course, is the culmination of the study. And I, I feel it's important, I state at the beginning, that in, in the guidelines, which is the ICH guideline, they're very clear and it's very logical about what they expect to, the reviewer expects to see in a clinical study report. They expect it to be complete. Um, they expect it to be free from ambiguity. So it shouldn't be confused at all. So therefore it should be well organized and there are uh, templates which I will show later. And it should be easy to review. The harder it is for the reviewer to do the reviewer's task, then the, as we all feel when we read a document which is extremely confusing and difficult, then our attitude changes to be more critical of the content. So therefore, it, it's in our own best interests as companies to be clear, uh, to give a clear explanation of the study design, why it was chosen, enough information on the plan, the methods, and the conduct of the study, uh, what went well, uh, what uh, should have been better, so uh, deviations are important. Um, there shouldn't be any ambiguity in any of it. It must be very clear. Um, the appendices should re have enough individual patient data, the demographics, the baseline data, the details of the analytical methods, so that the critical analyses can be replicated uh, by the reviewer, by the authorities when they wish to do so. And it's very clear that, you know, patient data should be in, in the document and clearly, clearly uh, uh, described. From the perspective of uh, the company that's writing the report, it's the opportunity to include the key messages about the drug which will carry through the whole uh, development pathway of the drug. And these are the messages that the, the company should want the um, authorities to, to absorb so that they actually understand the, the full nature of the final uh, application that the sponsor is making. Why, why should this drug be approved? What does this drug or this device offer to the patient for which it's being targeted. So it's really a very straightforward approach. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing to be afraid of in a clinical study report, as long as 
uh, the company doesn't feel that it's an opportunity to hide ambiguities and, and errors. It's not the place, it's not a report in which that should happen because it will be detected by an experienced reviewer. So really, as I've stated, um, even though a study is terminated early, then the report should be completed anyway. So it's really uh, essential that um, whatever we do, we document. And you know in clinical research, if it's not documented, the general opinion is, well, it didn't happen. Um, they ha we have to meet the standards of ICH guideline for structure and content of clinical reports. This is not difficult. It's extremely well documented. And it just requires an internal organization, uh, which, is either, which is either going to do this itself, or it's going to contract out the work to uh, an organization or writer uh, who is experienced in the requirements of writing clinical study reports. <clears throat> it's very important that this is established at the beginning because if it's not, then this is where confusion can enter into the process. And if we have a, a strange combination of internal writing, external writing, uh, various writers engaged, then this is where mixed messages are very easy to appear and inconsistencies appear between the study report and other documentation. And these will be detected and these will show there is confusion. So um, essentially the document um, that's created will be approvable, will be reviewable or acceptable to all regulatory agencies. There's no great dif there's no difference between the FDA and the EMA as to in regard to what they're looking for in a clinical study report. I mean, uh, they simply, as I've described, looking for the same uh, content. Yes, the uh, FDA has its own regulation, which is, I list the links at the bottom of the slides so you can uh, review. But really, the, the reality is, uh, though it's a lot of documentation to describe what they need, it's really um, a quite uh, clear uh, how we should approach a CSR. Uh, there's a long history, obviously, and many documents that have, uh, with going back to 1995, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't change the reality. And if you look at the most recent, which I'll scroll through to and, and, and work from there, then it's very clear uh, what the authorities are requesting. So ICHE3 is the most recent. It's very concise and clear as to what is needed to be, uh, to be written. Um, the important aspect of, uh, of the ICH is that it's a guideline. It's not a, uh, it's not a mandate. Uh, it really uh, is stating how they would like to see, what they would like to see in a report, how they would like to see the structure, but it gives the opportunity for the, uh, the writer or the company uh, organizing the writing to have some flexibility in how they approach it. So it's always a guideline and it should not be seen as um, uh, writing on a tablet of stone. This is clearly, a there is clear flexibility in how it's approached as long as the goal of uh, clarity and ambiguity, lack of ambiguity is very clear. Sorry, next. There are different types of uh, clinical study reports, obviously relating to the purpose of the uh, of the study was this a pivotal study um, therefore demanding a full study report 
Was this a, a, a supportive study? Perhaps one that um, was terminated early, was incomplete, or was a national supportive study, or was in a particular population, which would have an abbreviated report. And then there are synopses as well. So essentially what one is doing is using the tool to submit the data of the uh, therapeutic, the prophylactic or the diagnostic uh, agent that is at the heart of this. So the full study report, the, the complete EC, E3 report is for all clinical and human pharmacological interventions that essentially are looking to really to uh, describe the effectiveness uh, of the indication uh, of the drug in the indication and supporting the actual labeling, which is what really you're looking for. What is the target indication that all of this development is uh, orientated to, uh, to? This is the goal, this is the pivotal, and this is the full study report. And there may be, of course, the phase one, the phase two, the phase three, but these are the, these are the engine of the final label. Abbreviated reports, um, this is uh, trials that may have just been in a particular population uh, or um, perhaps were terminated early for reasons they couldn't enroll um, enough patients quickly enough or that something changed and therefore it's it's nothing to cast doubt on the effectiveness of the drug, it's supportive of the drug or the clinical pharmacology. And as always in clinical research, the goal is to show safety uh, before efficacy. So abbreviated reports have to contain all of the safety information that would have been in a full report. So there's no opportunity to miss a potentially adverse safety uh, reporting because it's an abbreviated report. That is absolutely not acceptable. Um, and therefore the synopses are for the others, perhaps an IIT investigator initiated trial or some other uh, uh, experimentation which is providing uh, data for the reviewer to tick particularly to evaluate the safety, um, the exposure of the patients to the drug. So the safety aspect is really important here. Um, so to help in terms of whether you are intending to do this in, in the company or whether you're going to um, brief a writer, external writer to do this, these are some key items on preparing, writing and review of clinical study reports. I've always uh, favoured um, a mix really uh, of ensuring if, if one doesn't have the skill, if one doesn't have the skill set within the company to write an effective clinical study report, then it's really essential not to try amongst people who don't have the experience to do it uh, because that's going to be a, a worse outcome and it's much better to find a, an effective report writer of which there are a number but they're always very busy because clinical research is very busy so the number of writers is limited uh, and I think one has to start early if this is going to be the plan in building a relationship with writers who would be able to potentially assist when the time comes to have the, the work done. So expecting a writer to be instantly available uh, for you is, is unlikely to happen because they're very busy. And as I described later, I mean, it's, a, it's an intensive workload for a writer um, to draft the report, then there of course uh, are the review rounds within the company and uh, sometimes if that's not well organized it can be very confusing as to who is actually leading the review and that's an important aspect to consider is to be well organized 
in in the own uh, company as to how this is going to be managed. But the principle, the main principle is, as I've said at the beginning, uh, transparency, clarity, and lack of ambiguity. So the guidelines really explain uh, very clearly uh, what should be prepared and how. And I think it's very easy to review, review and see, you know, what re is required to be done and how to do it. So, um, as it says in red at the bottom of this slide, uh, it's always expected and it's a legal obligation now in the US for steady data to be recorded in clintrials.gov and in the uh, UDRA CT database. So it's a really an important aspect of ensuring the completeness of the work that's done on the study. The good news is there are templates. So though it's not an instruction, there are templates that can be utilized, which makes it a lot simpler for, uh, for the writer, of course, but I still don't think it's advisable uh, to provide a template to someone in a company with no experience and expect them to be able to write a report. This is, this is for uh, people with the experience of doing this, the experience of understanding what needs to be included and to be able to ask the correct questions of the sponsor so that anything that's not being thought of can be, uh, can be considered as well. So there's a guideline on the ICH website or on the FDA website. So there is plenty of help uh, available to do this. There is, you may know, this organization called Transcelerate, which is a non-profit uh, US based organization which is supported by um, the major pharmaceutical companies the big the big pharmaceutical companies and they are their mission is to make clinical research efficient so they have no um, they have no uh, vested interest in any drug but they work to provide for example templates which are very carefully uh, well documented to provide uh, also an opportunity to use this template for when one is preparing a report. And as you see, they're annotated, so uh, they give a very clear guidance of what's uh, necessary. I think, as I've said, I believe if you don't have the in-house uh, capability, uh, go outside, um, but you need to know what the writer outside is going to ask for, and these are the kind, these are the data that's going to be required to be included in the report. So it should be no surprise what is actually required from the sponsor company to uh, to complete a report for a writer to complete a report. So. Um, no, have no surprises and be aware of the responsibility of the sponsor uh, to actually uh, provide the information to whoever is writing uh, the report. So Transcelerate is a very good and reputable uh, organization. The templates are, are very, very easy to use and the link there is Transcelerate Biopharma Inc. Com. So uh, very useful uh, tools indeed. And as you can see, how they're very clear in what's required and very clear in terms of the material that you have to produce for the actual writing of the report. Um, the FDA provides um, uh, a user manual, uh, which is also available. In fact, sorry, the, not the FDA, the European Medical Writers Association. Sorry, my mistake. The European Medical Writers Association is the association of all European um, medical writers who produce protocols, study reports and everything relating to clinical research. And they, of course, want to make uh, their life um, a little bit easier 
by having a reference user manual so that um, uh, sponsor companies aren't going to give them inadequate information, which simply makes their work harder to complete in any kind of acceptable deadline. So this is also available and uh, I would strongly recommend to use it. Now, how long does it take is a very, always a question that um, every sponsor asks and can it be done tomorrow? And the answer is uh, no. So um, this is a, a moderately complex CSR for a phase three study in 200 to 400 participants, which if you take um, intervention like a, co a COVID vaccine, you can see is, uh, you can imagine the amount of resource that was needed to complete reports with 20 and 30 and 40,000 uh, patients participating. So if one looks at 200 to 400, which is a modest phase uh, three trial, uh, a mean would be around 17 days, but from a receipt of all of the tables, listings um, uh, that are, you know, should be your statistical output to the first delivery of the first draft of the CSR. So that's obviously the fundamental that they get all the tables and listings, otherwise they can't do anything. Then, of course, the tricky part depends on the internal review. And that, as I said, has to be organized in advance. The last thing a writer wants is to have conflicting comments in a draft from different reviewers in a company. Because then, uh, you know, which, which does the writer pick? And this is very important that it's organized. And um, unfortunately, this is often... Um, a serious issue that the internal organization just isn't ready, uh, isn't uh, straight as to who is leading the review process and therefore conflicting comments appear regularly and make the review, make the writer's life harder and simply make the process a lot longer. So in theory, a mean, which of course is, a, you know, an average, of 26 days from the first draft to the final draft routed for review. Now, I mean, I don't know how long the outliers are, but I know that um, some reports when there's a chaotic uh, company can take a great deal of time. And um, uh, be aware that if you use a lot of medical writers time above and beyond what they quote for, then of course this has to be paid for. So the document can become very expensive if the uh, company is organized to deliver what the writer needs at the beginning. Um, if one works on a principle of at least a thousand euro a day for a writer's time, and probably um, if they're busy as they are um, more now, then of course it can become very expensive if uh, the company isn't organized to help the writer do the writer's job. So I think um, I hear often as a CRO, well, can we have database lock in 30 days? And frankly, usually no, despite um, uh, the ability to try and execute all the final queries on time, it's very difficult to achieve that. And particularly in the environment we're in now of many studies uh, and catch up after being unable to be closed because of COVID. But um, the, S, the sort of mean time for completion of a data from completion from database lock to completion was about 83 days. But again, it very much depends on how efficient and well organized the sponsor is. So as I've said, it's really essential that you have engage an internal team, that there's a leader. Uh, one has to have a, an empowered leader to get this work done. And the leader of the process has to engage, uh, has to identify the stakeholders that are required to actually provide the information uh, that would be needed for each section of the CSR. 
So the statisticians, the data managers, and the content experts are fundamental here. And um, it's really important that uh, the CSR is consistent with everything else that's been written and is absolutely fundamental that it's um, consistent with publications, uh, with the protocol, um, and that messaging is consistent across all documentation because uh, if it's inconsistent and there are anomalies, then of course the reviewers can become confused and you lose, uh, you lose the, uh, their goodwill in terms of their review. So, um, as you know, with all documentation, um, the, 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 the leader has to get the commitment from the relevant stakeholders and they need to ensure that they, uh, they know the scope of work that's required of them, you know, what's the deliverable they have to make and what's the timeline. And uh, it's really an imperative because otherwise the process can take a great deal of time and that becomes more expensive as well. So, as always with any document, um, the study design, the objectives and the population are clearly important in the background. What I would say though is the best place to start any report in drafting is in the conclusions. So the, 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 the section that should be written first is the executive summary. What do you want to achieve from this report? Does it, you know, this is the place to start and then to work backwards and fill in the background rather than the other way around. So it's always better to start at the end and go back to the beginning than start at the beginning and go to the end because you lose the message very easily in uh, spending too long on the study design, the objectives and the population, because um, it simply uh, is, you know, the logic that one runs out of uh, um, capacity faster if one starts uh, spending a huge amount of time on the background and not enough time at the beginning thinking about, well, what did we achieve with this study? What is our message? What is our take home? Um, yes, we need a review of the literature, the product, the therapies, that's important for context. But it's very important that, and I will say it over and over, that key messages are really important because not every development goes to plan. And you're really looking to potentially guide the reviewer to, uh, to the areas where you know there is a weakness. Uh, and where you know you have considered not only the weakness, but how you would solve the weakness, how you'd address it, rather than just avoid discussing the weaknesses and letting the reviewer find them, because that's, um, that makes the reviewer work harder. What they want to know is you thought about how this uh, study was done, uh, what went well, what went badly, and what solutions you brought into place to, uh, to address the issues. So messaging is really key and how you approach the, mess the messaging. Um, as I say here, this could be pretty short, uh, but don't make it too long because this is not the key section of the report. Um, to ensure consistency with the protocol uh, and, complete, and completeness with the protocol because you don't want the reviewer to have inconsistency and this can often occur if somebody uh, uh, simply uh, edits what the inclusion exclusion criteria were for example and makes a mistake you want to avoid that so one can easily cut and paste these sections from the protocol and therefore ensure that one has consistency between protocol and report. Um, it's really important too that the reviewer can see that the CSR stands alone as a document. Um, it's got to be concise, there's no point having it uh, hundreds of pages because that's no use for the reviewer. 
but it's got to be compre uh, comprehensive so the reviewer understands the design, the objectives, the processes, and the analyses without having to cross-reference always to the protocol. Because if the protocol is 100 pages long as well, it's a lot more work and more work, more time and more irritation. Um, it's got to be consistent in language use across all documents. And this is a really important aspect that terminology, definitions and language are consistent across the whole development. Again, this is a key, a key comment that's made, avoid ambiguity. So changes in terminology and definition are, you know, absolutely to be uh, avoided at all cost because this simply makes it more complex uh, for the reviewer. Um, results obviously are key. Um, there's the template uh, and uh, all the, uh, the templates available uh, and tables for document for document structure. Um, it's really key here that signals and trends are uh, clearly defined and aligned with the key messages where possible so that uh, the, the safety signals don't differ from the message that you're trying to give about the drug because otherwise uh, the, the message is surely doubtful if the safety signals don't support it. Um, patient disposition and demographics are clearly important because the reviewer wants to be able to get the whole picture of uh, uh, how, what patient types were exposed to the, to the intervention. Um, we can't hide from protocol deviations. It's uh, really important that we don't. Uh, particularly though, not, not the minor, the minor don't matter, but any that would have impacted uh, patient safety are absolutely critical, or the evaluation of the outcome, the endpoints. Did, you know, were the, were the uh, deviations not detected early enough, and uh, when they were detected, has this negatively impacted the outcome, is really important. So it comes back to effective study management and frankly addressing any deficiencies that are detected in the in the protocol description so that deviations can be avoided. Um, writing notes to file isn't really useful uh, if key, um, key uh, interventions have been missed, key tests have been missed or simply weren't practical and that's why they weren't done. Um, and this wasn't addressed by the sponsor in a protocol amendment. It's pointless um, having um, uh, lab assessments conducted at the weekend when it's apparent from the sites that their laboratory is closed at the weekend and therefore they won't do, uh, they won't do the actual uh, um, blood draw because there's no lab to do the assessment. I've lived through... Um, as a CRO, we live through an intensive care trial. Uh, as you know, intensive care is the most complex area to do clinical trials because um, patients, uh, it, it operates 24-7 and most clinical research organizations don't. Uh, for this, we had to. And uh, the, the sponsor hadn't considered some of the basic uh, issues such as a requirement to take serum albumin uh, exam uh, samples at the weekends. Well, they questioned why it was relevant in the first place. And secondly, as they pointed out, the labs were closed at the weekend, so uh, there would be no point to do them, and so they didn't. And it's no good the sponsor trying to argue, well, you know, this is in the protocol, they have to step back and consider, well, why did we even want that in the first place? Was this just a nice to have when we didn't actually need it? And if so, well, why didn't we change the protocol to remove it? Uh, make life more, um, make the study more acceptable, more complete for the uh, physicians who are trying to deal 
with patient care and also meet the requirements of the study. One of my particular interests is in patient centricity. In other words, that we, we continue to design trials without considering the patient as the center of the trial. And so we make uh, life unnecessarily difficult for the patient. Uh, do they really have to go every two weeks to the hospital? Uh, is it really that important? Uh, what, you know, can we decentralize any of this so that um, some things can be done at home? Uh, or is it vital that they go? Is it vital that all these procedures are conducted? Because if we make it too difficult for the site, there'll be deviations. And if we make it too difficult for the patient, they'll drop out. So um, pro uh, patient discontinuation is a big issue. And um, in times of COVID, for example, it was much more difficult for patients to get to hospitals. And so, of course, complex studies that required uh, these uh, tests, because it seemed like a good idea, uh, suffered as a result of that. So deviations are really, really important to address early on in the actual study and try to stop them. So uh, prevention, rather than um, um, trying to um, uh, re you know, reduce the impact, prevention is the key. So assess and evaluate study outcome results against primary endpoints. Um, obviously, that's the key. Um, I don't know of any drugs usually that are approved on secondary endpoints on tertiary, ter, uh, tertiary endpoints, because that doesn't work that way. So primary first, that's why it's called primary, then secondary, and then potentially any additional. Um, you know, largely irrelevant endpoints uh, aren't, aren't going to um, uh, replace the fact that the primary endpoint wasn't met. Uh, patient narratives are really an important important source of context for the reader. The reader, the reviewer, wants to be able to try to rebuild the study from the CSR. And um, the patient safety is pretty straightforward. So ICHE 3 in section 12 uh, describes the patient narrative for um, the components for the patient safety narrative. And it's really uh, obvious what's First of all, what's the exposure? Because that's the key um, determinant first. Second, what are the uh, adverse event profile? What's the adverse event profile? And third, what's the serious adverse event profile? So very much straightforward. Um, collaboration internally with the team, driven by the project lead, um, and really having an understanding of the adverse events and the study database administrator to, to help to generate patient and event narratives for the CSR. Really, really important that the safety aspect is really clear. And um, because otherwise, as I stated early in this uh, talk, safety is first, efficacy is second. So this has to be really very clear as to how this was run. And I hope that, you know, if there were, there was ongoing review of the safety profile of the drug and uh, any necessary uh, changes were made to the protocol design to, uh, to ensure that the patient's profile, safety profile is uh, sufficiently good. Um, and, you know, if, this, if, the, if the profile is bad, then of course the study could well be terminated early because it's just not uh, appropriate to continue to treat patients with the drug which is causing them harm. There's been, um, there's quite a few um, references on uh, patient narrative and safety and this is covered um, here. Uh, I think this is very useful. So um, again, if you don't find the information you need in the template, um, in the annotated template, then you, one also can reference these 
uh, publications, which I've listed three. As I said at the beginning, the, the conclusions should be written first, at least the draft conclusions. The Americans call it the straw man because the straw man was a game, I think it was an American game where they used to make a, a figure out of straw and then they would beat it with sticks to, um, to make it fall apart. So the straw man of a document is really the, the, the one that's going, that's built and then everyone sees if they can take it apart because it's inconsistent with the data. So. These are really important. Now, the, the template gives the opportunity to place these after each section, which makes sense actually, because um, it helps the reader if uh, they can see there's a conclusion at the end of each section, and then a final conclusion. Um, it's obviously essential that, the, that they provide context and they align with the results. Um, you know, it, these are supposed to be conclusions and not just restating table summaries because uh, that doesn't achieve anything. So these have to be, uh, this is a key section and that's why I always suggest it's drafted first. Um, and then the conclusion section is a bulleted list because it's supposed to be easy for the reader. Uh, to highlight the key messages and the important outcomes. Everything that makes this a readable document is, is fundamental. Um, the executive summary, well, you know, I call that the conclusions, but the executive summary, uh, it should be also written at the beginning, drafted at the beginning, because this is the, the key to the whole document. If the if you don't read, if the reviewer uh, is happy with the executive summary, then they, the reviewer or reviewers will have a different attitude to the rest, reading the rest of the report. They'll be more positive in their outlook. Um, so obviously placed at the front of the document, uh, it's a well-crafted overall summary. Um, it aligns with everything else and in here are your key messages and it's really important that uh, you've really crafted these because this is going to be hopefully your label when, uh, when this uh, uh, development is completed. So really the really important aspect of, uh, of the report is to do this well and at the beginning. Um, as I say, Internally, it can get very confusing in companies if there's nobody who is leading the process, uh, who is, you know, has, is empowered to, uh, to make the, some decisions. Um, because one, yes, one has to have a cross-functional review, uh, but one has to have a leader for that. And obviously, a fundamental aspect of the cross-functional review is ensure the um, accurate key study messaging and the data, but also to ensure that the messaging across the whole of the other documents is consistent as well. Um, if, if you don't have uh, internal uh, medical uh, skill in review of patient narratives and conclusions, then you have to you have to buy it. Uh, there are, of course, many uh, senior uh, clinical development physicians available. Uh, clearly, one needs to have a, a logical flow of the, through the document. It needs to read like a good story. And as I've said, it needs to have consistent um, uh, language, terminology, definitions uh, across the whole document, because otherwise there is confusion and that's, that's not the good place to be. Um, obviously, uh, we've all probably experienced in our lives that documents have gone missing off our drives, and that would be uh, horrendous. And of course, the biggest issue with such a document is version control. Um, I've had experience of doc uh, version uh, 
documentation software and I find it extremely difficult. So one has to, again, the process leader has to define how the documents are going to be uh, labeled and how the document uh, versioning is going to take place and obviously where the document is going to be stored so that there isn't confusion and there isn't any risk of loss. And uh, obviously one of the aspects of choosing a writer is to ensure to know that this person will apply the similar approach as you have. So I, I know we've got, I have a few chat messages there which I'll get to. Um, the CSR is nothing to be afraid of. Um, it, this is the, the requirement to complete. Uh, it's very well documented how to do it. Uh, there's a, a lot of help out there. And if you don't have the experience in the house, then uh, you can buy it. But beware that experienced writers are very busy and you can't just expect that they're instantly available. Every study needs a report and uh, simply there's just a lack of experienced writers in this industry. A key leader in the company is fundamental uh, to all of this and to define the rest of the stakeholders and to define the, the uh, timeline. Uh, a project manager that just documents is not going to be the one you want here. You want someone who's going to lead the process uh, because otherwise it's simply not going to work. Um, a small story, many, uh, many, many years ago, I, uh, I spent my entire life in the um, pharmaceutical industry, working life, and uh, I moved from uh, uh, Hoffman La Roche in the UK to uh, headquarters in Basel in Switzerland, and I um, went to see the then uh, CEO of the farm division, a man, uh, Dr. Armin Kessler, and uh, he was a very interesting um, CEO. He was a very big um, uh, South African uh, of uh, Dutch origin, and he sat in his big office with music playing, smoking a cigar, uh, which tells you the time period we were in. And he had, uh, I noticed he had a, a plaque on his desk and it said, uh, lead me, follow me, or get out of the way. And uh, that was his approach to, uh, to running uh, the rush of the time, uh, which was a revolution within the company. And uh, I, I really, that always stayed with me as an approach that when you want something doing, you have to have someone who is willing to, uh, to, um, to lead, and if people don't want to be um, alongside, then they have to follow, or they have to um, uh, get out of the way. And so the last four years of my life in Roche, working life in Roche, was leading uh, a, t a development team outside the main organization, uh, because the main organization had become uh, sclerotic, uh, focused on uh, minutiae and not focused on actually effective drug development. So when a small biotech company called Amgen, which is now an enormous biotechnology company, came to Roche with a drug called granulocyte colony stimulating factor to partner, uh, Armin Kessler's great fear was if this uh, got into the internal organization of Roche, then it, they would effectively kill it because they would just not be able to work with a small biotech, which was very uh, uh, hungry and, um, and uh, loosely structured, but really wanted to develop its drug. So I was tasked to take a team outside of the company and to develop the drug independently of the company. So we had the money from the company, but we had very few resources and we stayed off the campus. 
so that we were out of the way. And we took, in the next four years, we took the drug through from uh, end of phase two, through two phase threes, through registration, manufacture, and on to the market. And it became a, a blockbuster of the time with uh, peak sales of $5 billion. And it introduced Roche to oncology. Well, we wrote the CSR, um, the, the, uh, med, the head of medical, our, our clinician, our only clinician, uh, with the lead principal investigator of the drug in Australia, uh, and uh, with Amgen uh, assistance wrote the CSR. And uh, this was done in all manner of strange ways. I wouldn't recommend to do it now this way, but the point was a small team could deliver a major development because we were very focused and we, uh, we only focused on the delivery, uh, the quality in the delivery. And this is the way that the pharma industry has to go in future. Um, as I stated here, there's plenty of support uh, for anyone who wants to write a CSR. And um, it's just not difficult to meet the guideline as long as one uh, reads it and appreciates what it's there for. A guideline, but to be followed. I think that's my last slide. Thank you. I'm now open to uh, questions. Anybody, if anybody has a question, you may feel it's difficult to ask me a question. I understand entirely that you're working through a translator. I, um, and I would just really say that if you don't want to ask a question, I'm very happy to receive questions in any other form. And my co-CEO, Charles Kim, is available as well. Uh, to relay questions to me, and I can respond by 네, email. 나이젤 굿맨 대표님, 고맙습니다. Thank you very much, Mr. Nigel Goodman. Now we will start taking questions. Those who have questions, please raise your hand. Those participating are remotely, please post your question in um, Q&A screen. Now let's take questions first from the floor. Those who have questions, please raise your hand. Um, any questions are welcomed. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. I see one hand. We'll get the microphone to you. Could you please introduce yourself briefly? Jim? Um, it was so interesting to listen to this useful information as well. So actually, it's not basically related to the contents you gave. Um, it's kind of a personal question from my company. Um, I would like to know whether the CSR submission guidelines have been changed over 10 years, like whether 10 years ago the CSR submission was a part of NDA, not as a part of, you know, completion of your trial. Yes. Is it changed? No. So 10 years ago the regulations were same as, uh, as of now, right? Well, I mean, the, the basic principle is the same. Um, the basic principle of what you want to achieve, yes, they've clarified aspects of the documentation, such as ICAT-3 was written in 2012, or was, they clarified E3 in 2012. They clarified some confusions in the structure, but essentially, the principle has not changed, no. Clarifications of how it's written, yes, and, you know, the focus, but the principle has not changed. So, okay, uh, I will be more specific about 2010, not 2012. So, you're saying uh, the way of, you know, writing the CSR was mentioned in 2012, but if I talk about... Clarifications. Clarifications in 2012. So in 2012, ICH, the, the, Europeans Med the European Medicines Agency, in 2012, published a questions and answers relating to R1 on clarifications 
in the in the content but it was not changing the content it was basically clarifying questions that people had because um, as they restated at the time it's a guideline it's not a diktat as to what the way that the report has to be written and so nothing fundamentally has changed um, thank you and well, i would like to have a last question and it's about i i'm just curious if i uh, if a trial is completed after the completion date of the trial how long fda requires to the to the submission of csr um well, I don't think there's, um, I'll have to check. It's a good question. I don't think there's any requirement. For, I mean, the submission of the CSR depends on what you want to do next. So um, uh, I don't think there's a mandatory period. Uh, but obviously, um, drug development should, uh, should proceed uh, ex expeditiously because the goal is to get the, you want to finish development, right? Um, time is money, so the longer it takes, the more it costs. The market is changing, more drugs are becoming available. So the basic message is to go as swiftly as possible. But it's in your hands as a company. It's not in the regulatory authority's hands. But clearly they're not going to want to read a CSR years after you conducted the trial when treatment has changed and it's therefore no longer relevant. But that's of no interest to a company either, because, you know, what was the point, right? Um, you know, yes, you can, a drug can be taken so far in delivery, taken so far in development, then it can be put on hold, and then somebody else can buy the drug and can uh, re, uh, restart the development. But the danger there is that, you know, treatment has changed and the drug is no longer relevant to its marketplace. So what was the point? So uh, timeliness is fundamental in drug development. Thank you. Time is money. I don't know if that translates in Korean, but time is money. My personal. Thank you very much for the questions and answers. I'd like to accommodate one more question from the on-site participant. Um, I must say that, uh, frankly, sometimes the the waste of uh, company that companies make because they're not organised internally to do to um, pro make progression in drug development is is a pity i think the industry wastes a lot of money uh, which is um, unfortunate and uh, i think you know we 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 could do a lot better as a, a healthcare industry and not waste so much money in drug development we need to just be better organized at um, what we're doing and make decisions in a more timely fashion We have received some questions in advance, so we will start um, taking those questions. First, if uh, we have uh, early clinical trial um, in Korea and whether um, FDA and EA may accept this result and uh, whether we can continue next step trials in EU and US, what do you think? When the initial clinical trial was done in Korea, the result accepted. Online. If anybody wants to send an email, please, um, you know, I'm sure you can do that through through uh, Cobia or in any other way, and I'll have, be happy to um, uh, respond. I believe um, if there's nothing else, I think it's now your uh, your lunch, right? Your break, correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, we will ask one more question since we already received it. In a conclusion, what do you think EMA or FDA reviewer mostly focused on the CSR review? 
So um, would you like to respond to this question? Um, so there is another question, Mr. Nigel Goodman. Do you hear us? Um, we would like to ask for your understanding. There is a delay 